So uh, I think we can start. Uh, we're just after um, 7.30. So uh, good evening, uh, good morning uh, or afternoon, everybody from wherever you're watching around the world. Uh, and welcome to our Zoom meeting on this very important and timely topic on the International Criminal Court and the so-called situation in the state of Palestine. Firstly, I will briefly introduce our two esteemed speakers, Andrew Tucker and Alan Shatter, uh, followed by a brief uh, introduction to the matter at hand. Then there will be a discussion, uh, followed by an audience Q&A. So I would ask you people, if you, um, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, put them into the chat box um, at the bottom of your screen, and we will try and get uh, through as many of them as possible. Okay, so I will, I will introduce uh, Andrew first. Um, is, uh, I just want to uh, make sure that the three speakers now are, are spotlit, um, Andrew, Alan and myself. Andrew Tucker is Programme Director at the Hague Initiative for International Cooperation, uh, acronym THINK, T-H-I-N-C. Andrew studied law in Australia and uh, the UK. He worked for almost 20 years in Australia, the UK and the Netherlands as advisor to private companies, governments and public organisations in international and European law. Andrew has taught courses in international commercial arbitration, European law, international legal aspects of infrastructure development, public procurement law and international energy law at the University of Melbourne and the TMC Asser Institute at The Hague. From 2004 to 2018, Andrew was Executive Director of Christians for Israel International and Legal Counsel to the European Coalition for Israel from 2008 to 2019. He currently serves as Editor-in-Chief of Israel and Christians Today, um, he writes a weekly column and is international advisor to Christians for Israel International. Uh, Andrew is also principal of Tucker and Associates and co-founder of Think. Alan Shatter, uh, many of you will, will know, uh, certainly um, our viewers in Ireland. Alan served as Ireland's Minister for Justice, Equality and Defence from 2011 to 2014. He was a Fine Gael TD for the Dublin South constituency from 1981 to 2002 and from 2007 to 2016. He is also a former chairperson of the Irish Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. He was a founding partner in the Dublin solicitors firm Galher Shatter from 1977, uh, 1977 to 2011 and broke the mould by his advocacy in Ireland's high and supreme courts. He is a former Law Society lecturer and the author of several academic and other publications. His most recent book, uh, published uh, in 2019, is a brilliantly written political memoir entitled Frenzy and Betrayal, uh, which details his extraordinary story of a cataclysmic period in Irish politics. Okay, introductions over. Uh, I will now give a very brief introduction um, of the matter at hand, what we're uh, going to be speaking about this evening, and then I will um, uh, hand it over for, uh, for, for discussion. So as many of you will already know, um, on the 5th of February uh, 2021, the pre-trial chamber of the International um, Criminal Court published its decision that the ICC has jurisdiction to prosecute Israeli and Palestinian leaders uh, for crimes committed <clears throat> on the so-called territory of Palestine, thereby giving permission to the prosecutor to open an investigation into war crimes committed on that territory. 
Now, um, some of us believe that nothing further would happen until the new chief prosecutor, Karim Khan, was uh, appointed in June uh, of this year and that a, a relevant dialogue uh, could be opened with him. Um, but uh, yesterday, on the 3rd of March, outgoing chief prosecutor Fatou Bansouda announced that the court would indeed uh, now proceed with an investigation. And so uh, with uh, no more ado, I will um, introduce my first question to Andrew Tucker. So Andrew, <clears throat> welcome. Uh, great to see you. Um, and Andrew, could you just tell us what exactly is the International uh, Criminal Court? And is it a United Nations body? Jackie, thank you. Good evening. And thank you so much for organising this event. Good evening, uh, everybody. It's a uh, privilege and a joy to, to be with you. I'm speaking from uh, near The Hague in, in the Netherlands. Um, so the, the International Criminal Court was set up. It's a, it's a very young organisation. It's only 20 years old. It's the first and only international criminal uh, tribunal in the world. Um, and it was set up after a number of uh, specific international criminal tribunals had been set up for the former Yugoslavia, for example, uh, in the 1990s. And there was a growing sense that there needs to be some kind of international tribunal that looks at the most atrocious crimes in the world um, that can't be dealt with by uh, national governments or won't be dealt with by them. Um, and it sort of needs to have this, this international jurisdiction. It's not a UN body as such. It was not set up by the UN. It's a separate body. It has its own statute, the Statute of Rome. Uh, and there are, uh, there are 193 UN members, but there are only 123 uh, ICC members, members of the Rome Statute. Uh, so that means that a number of countries are not members, and that includes, for example, the United States, China, Russia, uh, and Israel, uh, who decided, by the way, I mean, Israel was one of the founding um, founding countries in, in the whole setting up of the ICC, but decided at the last minute not to join the ICC because it felt that it would probably become a political institution which I'm afraid it has. Okay, okay. Um, Alan, um, I'll, just, I'll just go over to you. Could you um, tell us a little bit about what um, the, uh, the role of the, um, I mean, can the ICC, when can it investigate crimes? And just tell us a little bit about the, the role of the, of the state, of the state parties, the Rome Statute. Sure. Well, well, firstly, I mean, the ICC um, is essentially designed to investigate crimes that take place within a state in circumstances in which the state lacks the capacity to investigate them themselves. And uh, in the context of uh, the statute, it was uh, generally understood at, uh, at the start that the ICC uh, didn't have jurisdiction in relation to a particular state, unless that state was uh, a signatory of the Rome Statute. Uh, and of course, as Andrew has quite correctly said, um, Israel isn't. Now, the process that the uh, court goes through is it receives a, a complaint about events that take place within a particular state. It can receive... Uh, the, the state itself can ask that events within its territories be investigated. Um, and in this instance, it was the Palestinian Authority who back in 2015 uh, asked that the International Criminal Court investigate uh, certain uh, events uh, relating to Israel. Uh, we, or that's what in, in, initiated the matter. Now, we'll come to what those events are perhaps in, in another question. Um, so the role of the ICC is to investigate effectively, have there been uh, what's known as war crimes 
or crimes against humanity, or has there been genocide, or more recently when they extended it, has the state been engaged in uh, a- aggression against uh, another state. But ultimately uh, what the court does at first, uh, or it's the prosecutor attached to the court. There's a prosecutor's office. The current prosecutor is uh, Fata Ben Suda, whose term of office finishes mid-June. And the, the initial role of her and her office is to investigate issues when complaints arise. And in the context of complaints relating to events that took place, uh, well, what they describe as the situation of Palestine, uh, effectively three issues have arisen which relate to Israel, one which relates to uh, Hamas or a mul- a multiple of issues relating to Hamas. And the initial step that was taken was to ascertain, ascertain whether the, uh, from her perspective or her officer's perspective, there, were, there was a reasonable basis for believing a prosecution may be appropriate. Uh, but the initial issue was, did the uh, International Criminal Court, did her office have jurisdiction to enter into an investigation? Uh, and the second issue then is uh, proceeding with an investigation if they had jurisdiction. Uh, the perspective of many who were involved in the preliminary stages was that the, there was no jurisdiction to investigate issues relating to Israel. Uh, the judgment, Jackie, that you mentioned delivered on the 5th of February by what's known as the pre-trial court, uh, which is a preliminary court dealing with preliminary issues uh, on a two to one decision, a majority decision determined uh, that there is jurisdiction. Uh, there's a lot of controversy around that. We might come back to that. And then by coincidence, this, this event is uh, very timely because yesterday, uh, having received the benefit of that decision, uh, the prosecutor announced she was proceeding with her investigation. Uh, and a lot of issues arise out of that. And uh, uh, we'll come back to those. Okay. Andrew, could... <clears throat> um... Uh, Alan mentioned that there is a lot of controversy around around the jurisdiction. Can you explain to us um, what 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 this controversy actually is? Because um, I mean, they they said that uh, they're talking about um, you know uh, the state of Palestine, but it's not actually recognised um, as as a state by um, so many countries, um, and also Israel. Is not actually um, is is not actually a member state. So, um, can you just uh, give us a little bit of uh, background and 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 try and um, uh, explain some of the the controversy around this jurisdiction and what can be done about it? So, um, well, here's the thing. I mean, Palestine is is been controversial for a hundred. 100 years, ever since the Ottoman Turkish Empire fell. Um, and I, actually, I think it's quite significant. Almost exactly 100 years after the end of the First World War, and really when the controversy began, because the question was, well, um, I'm not sure if I'm well connected. I'm saying my thing is unstable here. Is it okay? Can you hear me right? Yeah, we yeah. can. You, you yeah. just, uh, you went a little bit uh, funny there, but it's, yeah, okay. you're absolutely fine. We can hear you great. Thank you. I go funny a bit yeah. more often. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but just the big picture is, um, you know, the world recognized a hundred years ago that the Jewish people are not foreigners in the Middle East. They, in fact, their nation was born in what is now known as Palestine. And so they have a right, not just a legal right, but a, a, a real historical right based on historical fact to reestablish their homeland in Palestine. Now, that, that was the principle that lay behind the Balfour Declaration and then the mandate for Palestine um, and it was internationally recognized by the League of Nations. Now, of course, the Jews were living all around the world, um, except for a minority in Palestine. And um, most 
people in Palestine were not Jewish. So there was a conflict from the beginning, um, and the Arab world rejected the idea of Jewish sovereignty. And I think this rejection is still at the heart of, of this issue. When the State of Israel was created in 1948, only months before the Arab world had rejected the idea of two states, an Arab state and a Jewish state. There could easily have been two states, but they were rejected in the end of 1947. And the Jewish state came into existence. And ever since, the question has been, well, what are the borders of this Jewish state of Israel? Um, and the issue was really latent until 1967 because Jordan occupied half of Palestine illegally. Um, and then, of course, Israel took back territories in the Six-Day War. Now, I mention all of this because I think it gives the context for understanding the territory that we're talking about. Um, now, the Palestinians, and we're talking about the PLO, that's the Palestinian Liberation Organization, that still exists, it's still the entity that Israel is supposed to be negotiating with, and their policy is that Palestine will be liberated from the Jordan to the sea. In other words, there's no place for a Jewish homeland. That's still the official line. Um, and this, this came out also in the ICC proceedings, by the way, that their charter has never been changed as they promised they would in the Oslo Court. kind of independence, which they probably have a right to, um, and Israel is willing to negotiate that. They've entered into agreements to do that, but they haven't agreed that there is a Palestinian state, and there can't be until the Palestinians accept the existence of the Jewish state. At least that's Israel's position. I think it's a fair one. Um, now, the Palestinians have made no secret of the fact that they're using this court, the ICC, as they're using the UN General Assembly and other institutions to achieve their goal, and that is Palestinian statehood, um, by bypassing effectively negotiations, I think is what is happening. Um, and Israel says, well, we're not a party to the ICC. Palestine is not a state. So to answer your question, Jackie, it's, this is problematic because um, as Alan rightly said, this court only has jurisdiction in respect of the territory of states who are parties to the ICC. You can't run around the world solving the world's problems because you want to. You only have the right to intervene in, in territories of states who have submitted or, or delegated their jurisdiction to the court. And as long as Palestine is not a state, as long as Israel is not a party, there simply is no territory that the court has jurisdiction over. So um, the court got around that by saying, well, the General Assembly has accepted Palestine as a kind of state, so that's good enough for us. Um, and I'm sure Alan can say a little bit more later on about why that's a pretty pathetic kind of line of reasoning. But uh, we, we have a situation now where... Um, you know, 100 years ago, we, we, we accepted and we gave the Jewish people the right to settle in Palestine, which includes Jerusalem and includes the West Bank. And now we're saying it's illegal for them to be there. And worse still, it's a war crime. And, and I think this is, this is um, problematic for many, many different reasons. Okay. Um and on uh, the subject of the of the West Bank, I mean, why do you think this is this has happened at this particular time? And do you think, um, with regard to the the so called settlements um, in Judea and Samaria, um, what is uh, it, it, do you think that is the reason? That is the main reason that the ICC has has made this decision at this time with regard to. To, to the settlements. Could you just address um, the settlements, please? I think, I think, Jackie, it's more complicated than that. 
um, take, taking up from, again from, from uh, what was just being said, the main focus of both the Palestinian Authority and many of the uh, organizations that engage in um, basically Israel bashing is to delegitimize Israel as a state. And they see the International Criminal Court as a very good mechanism uh, both to delegitimize Israel and to vilify it internationally. Uh, and I think it might be helpful if we came to just develop this a little bit into to what is this actually about in substance? Because uh, I think it, perhaps for those watching, it becomes a little bit more interesting. Uh, the issues that the court is going to, or the prosecutor says she's going to investigate, are, are basically in, uh, you, you can put them into four categories. One, I'm sure everyone remembers the uh, many hundreds of rockets that were fired into Israel uh, in the 2012-2014 period, which gave rise to two Gaza wars. The last one was in 2014, uh, when very many rockets were fired into Israel. Uh, some went very deep into Israel, and Israel felt the need to defend its people and, uh, and to respond. So the first allegation is that Israel's uh, response in that war was disproportionate, and in some way that, that breached uh, international law, in some way uh, this is a war crime. Um, the reality is that the Israeli army is one of the most ethical armies in the world, and the difficulty, difficulty Israel had during that period was that um, Hamas were firing rockets into Israel using, uh, using uh, many of the people who live in Gaza as human shields. And the rockets were coming out of residential areas. And the Israelis did as much as they could do very often uh, to, to warn the residents of Gaza that they were going to uh, be bombing a particular location or retaliating in a particular area. And of course, by doing that, uh, they were giving warnings also to those who were directly responsible for firing the rockets. So the first allegation is that Israel engaged in disproportionate force. I know the Israeli, uh, Israelis would say that they did what was necessary to defend the people of Israel against rocket attacks. So this, this is a, a deeply uh, political allegation. Uh, the, 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 there isn't, uh, that I'm aware, a war that's been fought somewhere where people who are um, the targeted by rockets turn around and say to their army, well, you can only fire as many rocks as they fire at us. What you try and do is, is stop the violence, stop the war, and you, as a government, have an obligation to protect your people. So that's one of the issues. Um, uh, they're looking at whether Israel, Israel uh, where there were some civilians who lost their lives, whether the Israelis intentionally killed civilians, uh, and is that a war crime? And, uh, of course, the Israeli response would be that there was never any intention to kill civilians. Uh, they're addressing uh, the issue of a particular uh, series of protests that took place at the Gaza-Israel border, uh, which were presented, and people remember some of these protests, as peaceful protests, but many of them involved a great deal of violence directed against uh, Israel and Israeli soldiers at those locations. Uh, so they're investigating whether events that took place there could constitute a uh, crime against humanity or a war crime. And then there's the whole issue of the settlements. Now, that's more complex, and uh, there isn't a brief answer to that, uh, other than under the relevant Rome statute, the, the transfer of populations to an occupied territory can be regarded as a crime under the Rome statute. But that envisages a state in some shape or form uh, forcefully transferring people or, uh, or literally putting people in buses and transferring them. And in the context of that issue, it ignores, ignores the totality of the history, which is that up to 1948, uh, even when uh, the number of Jewish people in uh, the, the former uh, mandate that was Palestine or during the Ottoman Empire period, uh, even when there was only small numbers of Jewish people, there were Jewish people living in Judea and Samaria. 
And the only time there were no Jewish people in Judea and Samaria was between 1948 and 1967, uh, when those lands were occupied by Jordan. Uh, the Israeli government, of course, isn't forcibly transferring people. Is uh, Israelis have chosen and Jewish people have chosen to go and live in parts of Judea and Samaria as part of the ancient homeland of Israel. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, uh, complex law behind what is the legal position of settlements in international law. Uh, should the West Bank be simply referred to as disputed territory or as occupied territory? It's become very popular uh, in uh, media and in political debate to refer to the West Bank as occupied territory. Well, in reality, they, it was occupied territory at a time when Jordan occupied it. And now it's disputed territory. And the Oslo Accords, which were concluded um, in uh, 1992, uh, was supposed to have provided the backdrop to resolving uh, disputes about territory and issues as between Israel and the PLO, or the Palestinians, and of course, that hasn't happened. So in those three particular areas, they're the issues that are going to be investigated. In relation to Palestinian groups, uh, there's also to be an investigation in particular into the conduct of Hamas, the deliberate um, uh, firing of rockets into Israel and civilian areas, uh, the use of people as human shields and other violations. So this isn't simply an investigation to the Israeli side, it's an investigation to Hamas. Um, it's welcomed by the Palestinian Authority because the Palestinian Authority itself isn't under investigation. And in my view, it should be, and its conduct should be, because of the extent to which it encourages uh, individuals to engage in terrorism in, in Israel, the pay for slave policy, uh, the education system in which young children are effectively uh, the victims of child abuse in that uh, terrorists who've bought, killed, maimed men, women and children are claimed as martyrs and young children are encouraged themselves to seek death through martyrdom uh, on behalf of the Palestinian cause. Um, it's unfortunate that it doesn't appear the investigation involves the Palestinian Authority. But they're, they're the issues that are being investigated. What uh, is interesting is the judgment, not the judgment, the announcement made uh, by uh, Ben Soudi yesterday is merely an announcement that she's now decided to proceed with the investigation. Um, she says she wants to engage with the Palestinian side and the Israeli side. It's unknown, will Israel in any way cooperate or engage? Uh, I assume that various pro-Israeli NGOs may engage in some shape or form. Um, uh, I very much doubt if Hamas is going to allow themselves to be investigated by her and engage in any particular way. Uh, one of the big issues that she has to look at in the context of the conduct of uh, the Israeli army is whether uh, Israel has a legal system which ensures that if there are allegations of misconduct uh, by members of the Israeli Defence Forces, uh, that they're fully and properly investigated. And um, it may well be the case that you have no choice but to reach a conclusion. They are, because Israel does have a very specific investigation system. There's no certainty that, uh, as she proceeds along this route, there will ultimately be a trial of anybody. But if there's to be a trial, and I'll conclude on this because uh, I don't want to dominate the discussion. If there is to be a trial, firstly, the investigation must be completed. Uh, specific crimes must be identified that the prosecutor believes uh, can be secure convictions beyond reasonable doubt. Um, by the time we get to uh, the investigation making any progress, the current prosecutor would have, been, would have departed and a new prosecutor from the UK will be taking up uh, this particular uh, this particular position. Uh, how he will view this um, is, is uncertain. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. But ultimately, it isn't Israel that's going to be prosecuted or Hamas that's going to be prosecuted. If there were to be any prosecutions, um, uh, individuals would have to be identified 
uh, specific individuals, normally individuals of great prominence who've directed illegality, who'd have to be identified to be put on trial. Um, possibly warrants for their arrest would have to be sought from the court. And that could reopen all over again the issue of the extent to which the court has jurisdiction to pursue this any further. Okay, okay. Um, just, uh, just I, I, I know that uh, when um, uh, when Fato Bensouda announced yesterday uh, that the court um, would proceed with an investigation, uh, there were a number of statements um, from Israel. Um, naturally enough, um, Prime, Prime Minister Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu said. He called it undiluted anti-Semitism um, and the, the height of hypocrisy. Um, Minister for Foreign Affairs Gabi Ashkenazi um, said that it turns the court into a tool in the hands of extremist actors and emboldens terrorist organisations and anti-Semitic groups. Um, Andrew, would you like to um, address that, the, the question of, do you, do you think it's anti-Semitic? Uh, I'm always. What's that? I'll ask Alan the same question. Yeah, look, I, I I'm always reluctant to put the anti-Semitism claim there because I think, in a way, it um it it distracts us a little bit. I mean, I understand the reaction, and it's a very emotional reaction, and I think it goes very deep. Um, and you see it across the political spectrum in Israel. It's not just you know, the right that reacts this way, it's, it's across the board that the idea of an international court deciding on, on the legalities of the way Israel operates just fundamentally uh, attacks really this, the sovereignty of the state. It's, it, it's again an example of how the state of Israel is not being taken seriously. Um, so... It, to your question, is it anti-Semitism? Unfortunately, I do think there is an element um, of, um, of anti-Semitism in this sense that there, there is an innate um, uh, uh, sort of rejection, as it were, of, of the, just the right of the, the existence of the Jewish people as a nation. Um, and I think it comes for many reasons. We don't have time to to go into them. Um, it's not the psychology of this, but if you look at the way the judgment writes about Israel, there, there's not the slightest sensitivity to the history of who this people is and how this state came into being and even how it's a democratic state that tries its best to look after every citizen of the state, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Hindu, whatever you might want to be, you can be that in Israel. Um, th there's kind of arrogance behind the decision which disturbs me as well. And what I think would be helpful is if not just Israel's leaders, but the leaders of other nations also spoke out, uh, as some of them have been doing. A number of states have spoken out strongly against the decision several weeks ago um, about the court having jurisdiction. And I'm sure more will make statements now uh, regarding the, the investigation. And it's really important that they do that, that um, because I think this undermines not just the Jewish people, but it's undermining the credibility of the international legal system that states have an interest in. So I think when we attack Israel, when we attack the Jewish people, we, we, we're undermining our own system. Um, we could say more about that, but that would be my answer to your question. Okay, thank you. Um, Alan, would, would you like to address that? Yeah. I think we have to understand there's a very emotional reaction in Israel to this because, as Andrew mentioned, Israel would have been a moving part here originally in being supportive of the establishment of a court of this nature. And it derived from a belief that there should be a universal approach in an international court to deal with uh, major atrocities. And that derives from the history of the Jewish people, and in particular from their, 
from, from the Holocaust. Um, Israel is living in a region in which it's the only democratic, truly democratic country. Uh, let's look at who its next door neighbors are. Um, Syria, horrific uh, atrocities have been taking place in Syria for many years. There's no suggestion anyone's going to bring Syria before the international court. Over half a million people have died in the civil war in Syria. Uh, many, many thousands have been tortured by Assad in his jails. Many thousands have been murdered by Assad in his jails. Um, Lebanon is a political basket case controlled by Hezbollah. Uh, uh, no one is suggesting, or, uh, despite some of the events that have happened there, that they should be investigated. So there's a visceral emotional reaction in Israel. Israel uh, Israelis, Israeli politicians, basically believe they're being targeted and picked upon. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not going to, and I won't accuse or suggest that either the prosecutor or the court is anti-Semitic. I don't think I don't think that's appropriate. Um, I do think there's an extraordinary blind spot in, in two respects in the manner in which this pros prosecutor is proceeding. Uh, there's a blindness to the reality uh, that a state has an obligation to defend itself against attack. Uh, the, the Gaza issue, uh, the events that took place uh, at the border between Israel and Gaza, none of those were initiated by Israel. Israel didn't invite rockets to be fired at it. It didn't invite people mm -hmm. to riot at the, Gaza, at the Gaza border and throw burning tires into Israel and uh, fire uh, various uh, different types of missiles into Israel during the course of some of those riots. There seems to be no, there seems to be some suggestion, uh, and I'm conscious I'm a Jewish person saying this, but there seems to be some suggestion that it's outrageous Jewish people defend themselves when they're under attack. And if they do defend themselves, they shouldn't fully defend themselves. They should only partially defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And that makes absolutely uh, no sense of any nature to me. I think the settlement issue, the whole complexity of it is lost in the approach that the prosecutor has taken. But of course, these are issues of substance that may ultimately be addressed by the court. Uh, and let, let me suggest uh, 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 there's an international simile, first of all. Um, no one is taking... Turkey currently to the International Court because of the almost uh, 150,000 uh, Turks who've moved from the Turkish mainland to northern Cyprus, which is under illegal Turkish occupation. And that doesn't seem to have created any great uh, trouble for the International Court. It certainly hasn't resulted in any investigation being undertaken. But let me give you a, a, a more close at home uh, perspective. I think the uh, approach of the Irish government to this is extremely disappointing. There's a pretense made that Ireland could play some constructive role in a peace process between Israelis and Palestinians, when the main Irish political focus seems to be uh, to target Israel with criticism as frequently as possible and to look the other way uh, when there's bad behaviour on the Palestinian side. Now, I'm saying that as someone who'd like to see a functioning peace process, which we don't have at the moment. Uh, but from the Irish perspective, Ireland um, has not uh, played any sort of um, uh, role worth applauding in all of this. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, states like Australia and Canada and Germany and the United States all made submissions to the International Criminal Court saying that this was inappropriate uh, for the prosecutor to travel down this route. And since uh, the decision of the court, uh, some have also been critical and the announcement yesterday generated criticism. Uh, so far, there's been silence from the Irish government. Now, I wonder what view the Irish government would take if uh, Unius in Northern Ireland identified the number of people born in the Republic who are currently living in the north of Ireland and accuse the Irish government of creating settlements in the north of Ireland mm -hmm. and ask the International Criminal Court to investigate that on the basis that the Irish government won't investigate it 
themselves and uh, the Northern Ireland uh, 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 government lacks the capacity to investigate it. Now that's the simile, but what's happening here? You know, should, should Ireland be prosecuted for the International Criminal Court because there's a reasonable number of people born in the Republic who live in Northern Ireland? Um, uh, and if we take the view that would be insane and outrageous, and that wouldn't positively contribute to maintaining our peace process and dialogue between uh, nationalists and unionists and the different communities on this island, uh, it, it's beyond me why anyone thinks it contributes anything of benefit uh, to create an investigation in the International Criminal Court into Israelis or Jewish people living on the West Bank, or as they would regard it, Judea and Samar Samaria. Uh, the suggestion seems to be, uh, which is something that was regarded as inappropriate in Europe, uh, that uh, that whole area should be Judenrein or Judenfree, that no Jew should live in that area at all. Um, and I think uh, that reflects something that uh, the Germans tried uh, many years ago, with which we're all familiar. And I think one of the reasons why uh, Germany as a state and the German government is opposed to all of this is they see where this is leading to. Uh, they see that it's being suggested that there are basically parts of the world in which uh, Jewish people should be prohibited from living. In the context of Ju Judea and Samaria, uh, the history of that region, the history of the Jewish people, uh, um, it is a quite an extraordinary proposition in my mind that this is an issue the International Criminal Court sees fit to um, investigate. The other thing, by the way, that's interesting about the statement yesterday, the International Criminal Court has a considerable number of cases pending before it, some investigations going on many years. It's short of resources and short of funds and how rapidly it may progress this was said by the prosecutor in her statement yesterday to depend on resource issues and fund issues and what they prioritize. And uh, what we don't know is what the new uh, prosecutor would pri prioritize when he takes up his position um, on the 16th of June next. Mm. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have a question um, <clears throat> here uh, with regard to the to the US. Um, does Biden's election make any difference to the ICC attitude to Israel? Well, I, I, I saw that yesterday um, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken came out very strongly um, against the, the ICC um, decision. So I'll put that question um, to you, Andrew. Um, do you think that um, the U.S. Will, will have much influence here? And do you think that they will con you know, be very supportive towards Israel and continue to be so? Yes, um, it's a good question. Uh, thank you. I, look, I, it's very interesting that the United States uh, new administration is speaking out so strongly, uh, almost as strongly really as the previous. Uh, the Trump administration uh, even imposed sanctions on ICC staff from, uh, so they can't travel to the United States um, and they will, they've threatened to take proceedings if if action is taken against Israel um, because they see it as a threat. This case is a threat, not just against Israel, but against Western democracies and all states who are not parties to the court, including the United States. So I would expect this administration to keep up that line. I don't know whether they'll uh, they will keep the sanctions in, in place. I believe they're reviewing them at the moment, but um, I'm confident, and I think Blinken understands this. He's, he's a, is an interesting character. He's the son of a Holocaust survivor. He grew up uh, in Paris. Um, so I think he, on the one hand, you might say, well, he has a sort of globalist mentality, and he is very much in favor of, you know, US re-entering the diplomatic um, field and, and participating in multilateral institutions and so forth. But they seem to see 
and I think Biden himself does as well, that the ICC really is a threat to the sovereignty of uh, non-member states. So I expect that, uh, I don't expect that the US will have much influence on the new prosecutor or the court itself. Um, although I th there, there will be a, perhaps a slightly less antagonistic view towards the states. I mean, I think the previous administration sort of aroused a very anti-US feeling. That's not the case anymore. Uh, there might be a little bit more of an opportunity for dialogue or interaction between people. And, and I'm hopeful that the new prosecutor, who, you know, he has a lot of international experience. He knows how to, how to build relationships. He may even be willing to be more open to understanding the concerns of, of the United States and other states like it. Mm. Okay. Good. On, that, on that issue, Jackie, um, I, I think uh, some of what has been said in Israel um, will not really impact on where this all goes. I think in the context of, of the court, the court and those associated with it, and I'd be surprised if the new prosecutor took a different view, is very anxious to establish that it's entirely independent. Um, and it's not going to be influenced by anyone, including states. Uh, and I think once Israel has got over the emotional reaction to this, there's need for a very considered judgment as to how to deal with this, how to approach it. There's very serious uh, decisions to be made. Uh, do you cooperate? Do you not cooperate? To what extent do you engage? Um, if a court is investigating something, um, uh, I think in the preliminary work that Ben Suda did, she, she would have interviewed and met with people uh, outside uh, Israel and the West Bank and Judea and Samaria and interviewed some individuals and got some insights from her perspective. Now, if she's only hearing, if, if, if the prosecutor is only hearing one side of the story, if evidence that's available isn't given, for example, um, if you live in the town of Starat in Israel, which is only two kilometers from the Gaza border, uh, and you spend, have had in recent years, had to spend a considerable amount of time uh, in bomb shelters, and uh, you're given a two or three minute warning, uh, the rockets are coming in and you have to uh, get to safety uh, very rapidly. Sometimes the warning is, is literally a minute to get to safety. Um, Will some of the residents of that area who were the victims of rockets, so the, in Ashkelon, who were the victims of rockets, um, will, they, will they talk to the prosecutor who's investigating Hamas? Uh, will their talking to the prosecutor give greater insight into the defensive actions that the Israeli uh, army needed to take during the Gaza war to protect its own population? Or do, you, do, 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 do the Israeli authorities and people in Israel simply stand back from this process in its entirety. Now, the difficulty with all of this is this is a legal process. None of us know where it's going to go. None of us know how long the investigations will take. These investigations, by the way, could take years. Nothing is going to happen with any enormous, uh, with any enormous speed. And there's no certainty of, uh, of what the outcome will be. So the, there's a lot of complexity involved in all of this. But from the Palestinian Authority side, uh, so far this is win-win. Because even talk of Israel being involved with the International Criminal Court is seen to be damaging to Israel's reputation. The international media, uh, from some of the reports I've seen, don't even seem to realise or have any interest in the reality that Hamas is also to be investigated. Uh, if Israel doesn't cooperate with the court, well, then the propaganda will be not that the court has no jurisdiction over Israel and is entering into an area uh, of territory, legal territory, shouldn't be entering into. Uh, it will be that Israel is trying to cover up and they're obviously guilty and this is why they won't cooperate. So, so this is uh, legal warfare uh, and it's going to go on for a great deal of time. And it is, whatever the outcome of all of this, it is about demonising the Israeli state. It's about damaging it 
in the minds and the eyes of the general public. It's about encouraging multiple journalistic articles that are negative about Israel. And uh, it's an enormous distraction because it's distracting from the one thing that should be happening and is damaging. Uh, because if ever the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is going to be resolved, there's a need for Israeli leaders and Palestinian leaders to start rebuilding trust, to start engaging in dialogue, and to start talking about what can be done because we live so close to each other, we're neighbours, to actually deal with issues in a manner that benefits both the Israeli and Palestinian people. This will further undermine trust, it will add to antagonism and strife, and it is pushing a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict further down the road, not making it uh, uh, more likely that there will be some uh, major positive result in the short term. Lovely, thank you. I have a very interesting question here. Um, I'll, I'll put this to you, Andrew. Uh, Chief Prosecutor Ben Sidor refused to investigate the horrendous ISIS war crimes against minorities in Iraq on the basis that Iraq is not an ICC member. So her decisions on Israel and Gaza appear politically biased. I think we agree on that. Um, but will Ireland, as a member of the UN Security Council, assert any public view on the discrediting of ICC by and Suda, and can the new prosecutor, prosecutor can uh, address the abuse of the ICC uh, by, by Ben Suda? Um, I'll leave the question about what Ireland may or may yes, not do. Yes. I think I'll, I'll leave that one to uh, But maybe the, the first part. Alan, part. yeah. yeah. Um, look, th there, is, there definitely has been a serious issue about this prosecutor's closeness to the, the, the Palestinians. Um, it's been a long, relentless campaign. You know, there is a lot of evidence that she has been very receptive to, um, you know, receiving their narrative and the information and all kinds of NGOs who've been able to access the prosecutor's office Whereas groups, NGOs, others who've sought to uh, defend the Israeli position have, have not had that access. Um, now, I suspect, I think, I don't know enough about this new prosecutor, but he's clearly a very different person. Um, I'm sure he will operate very differently. He will want to be seen to be operating differently. And I think he will want to take a very fresh look at all of this. As Alan has said, um, even though the prosecutor's now decided to open an investigation, all kinds of things can happen from here to, uh, to take up cases or not take up cases, to, uh, to reprioritize. Um, so I, I think that the... Um, I think we'll see a different kind of prosecutor, but none of us really know how how it's going to pan out. Unfortunately, you know, the court remains under a lot of political pressure, even from within the state parties, to um, to to continue to investigate this situation, as it's called. So I, it would be very difficult for the prosecutor to, to drop the whole situation. But having said that, uh, I think he will be very reluctant to get himself into the deep black hole of some of these issues that, I, that Alan has touched on and the complexities that they, that they arise. Okay. So Jackie, I, I don't think yeah. you can say the prosecutor has behaved improperly. Um, we may disagree with her choices. We may disagree with the manner in which she's identified these issues as appropriate to be investigated. We may take the view that she has a, a blinkered perspective, but she didn't simply go off on a gallop. She first of all sought uh, direction from the pre-trial court as to whether the ICC had any jurisdiction to deal with these issues at all. Now, the court, uh, the pre-trial court was composed of three judges. It could have been composed of a different group of judges equally, but it was composed of three judges 
Two said, basically, she's right. One said, she's entirely wrong. And my two colleagues are entirely wrong. And the dissenting judgment uh, was practically contemptuous of the two judgments which said she was right. But this is where we are. She hasn't, it, it, in a sense, the court by a majority decision has validated the position she's in. And once that decision was delivered, it was always inevitable that she would then proceed to announce that an investigation would be commenced because she initially went to the court on the basis that there was uh, reasonable grounds for believing certain crimes that fell within the ICC's jurisdiction had been committed. So I think the announcement, uh, there seemed to be some belief in some quarters and also in Israel, that if we shout about this, this will all go away. It won't. Um, and the new prosecutor who's coming in, he himself has appeared in the International Criminal Court representing some individuals who have been prosecuted before that court. He has, in that uh, context, uh, complained about the manner in which uh, certain evidential issues have also been dealt with and brought before the court. Um, so, so he's been, he's now a prosecutor who's previously been a defender of some brought before the court. So yes, he's going to bring a fresh pair of eyes to all of this. He's going to have to decide what his priorities are. Um, but I don't believe he can simply drop this. Uh, this is going to have to progress in some shape or form. The question is, what is the shape? What is the form? Who actually engages with him and his investigators? and ultimately what judgments are made. It would be quite possible at the end of some form of investigation to determine um, there's no appropriate prosecution to be taken uh, against anyone at all on the Israeli side. Um, and they may also determine that it would be appropriate to bring a prosecution against some individuals on the Hamas side, but we don't have sufficient evidence to know who those individuals are. Mm. And there have been other instances of uh, known atrocities uh, that have taken place in some instances in African countries, where um, it's quite clear there have been atrocities, but actually identifying who you should prosecute for those atrocities has been extremely complicated. Mm. Okay, and, and with regard to Ireland, now that Ireland is a, a non-permanent member of the United uh, Nations Security Council, and I believe it's going to be president of the council um, in September 21. It will have some influence, will it? I mean, do you, what, no, what are you expecting to hear from from Ireland, if anything? Do you? I, I'm not expecting. I, I will be astonished if, if Ireland, or the Irish government, or some of my former colleagues say anything that's remotely helpful in this context. I don't think they have uh, the insight and understanding to see how this is detrimental to trying to reforge good Israeli-Palestinian relations. I don't think they see that this is detrimental to developing, uh, or if I put it better, reviving a moribund peace process. Um, the fact that I was on the Security Council is completely irrelevant uh, because uh, effectively the court is independent. There are circumstances in which court, the court can investigate matters as a result of them being uh, referred to it by the Security Council. But um, no, uh, the Security Council, uh, in the context of the manner in which the court is supposed to operate, doesn't have an influence over the court. Now, uh, what uh, neither, neither of us know is, does anything go on behind the scenes that isn't visible, that determines uh, how priorities are assessed within, within the court? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not going to suggest that that does happen. There's been much controversy within the court about other, uh, about various staffing issues, such as bullying and harassment. There's been uh, there's a whole report on difficulties the court has experienced. But no, Ireland being on the Security Council is relevant to this. I can't identify any likelihood that Ireland will do or say anything that's helpful in resolving this particular. Uh, complex issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's regrettable, by the way. I, mean, I don't, I, 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 but uh, this really now is a matter for the court and for the investigators and for those who could be impacted by an investigation and for uh, particularly um, 
the Israeli government or the new Israeli government and its uh, legal advisors uh, to determine from the Israeli side uh, how they wish to approach uh, this, this issue and what do they do when the prosecutor comes knocking and says, hello, we want to talk to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we can we can take one more question, um, and then I think we will we'll wrap up. Um, this is a question: the ICC investigation will investigate all crimes alleged to have been committed since the thirteenth of June, twenty fourteen. This would appear to exclude the kidnapping of Yael Rifrach, Gilad Shar, and Naftali Frankel on the twelfth of June, twenty fourteen, by Hamas. Um, from investigation. Is there a legitimate reason for failing to start the investigation upon the 12th of June 2014, or was this... Um... It, was, it was deliberately done by the Palestinian Authority. They chose the date from which they wanted, uh, quote, the situation in Palestine, unquote, to be investigated. Okay, okay. That's interesting. That's interesting. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, look, we've, uh, we're, we're, we're running over the hour now, so I think it might be a good idea just to take some uh, concluding uh, remarks and um, we'll wrap up. So, um, Andrew, um, would, you like to, would you like to start um, with some concluding remarks? Well, thanks, uh, Jackie. I, a lot's been said. It's hard to know um, really what to say, except that I think, uh, as, as we've probably said, we're, we now go into an, a new phase. Um, the decisions have been made. The, um, there is no appeal from, uh, from the pretrial chamber's decision. Uh, it becomes now a different kind of discussion which talks about the bigger picture, the big policy issues involved, the deeper issues, uh, that the ramifications of all of this, and it, it will take time, and it needs to take time. I think it's not really appropriate to be rushing into all kinds of um, assumptions or, or actions, although we're inclined to, and, and I know we all want to, um, you know, raise our voice, And but it, it's important to think this through, um, Governments are not helped necessarily by overhasty um, campaigns. Now, having said that, I mean, I think there's a role that everybody can play. And I do think it's important that with this kind of event that you've organised uh, and others, that people get on top of the issues as far as you can, that you can have a conversation about it with others um, and, and speak out where you can about the issues in an informed way because they are important issues and they concern us all. They concern Israel, they concern the Jewish people, but they also concern our, our nations and our governments. So I highly commend the work that you're doing and encourage you to, to keep, keep doing it and, and to be educated. We all need to be uh, educated as much as we can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Alan? Well, Jackie, I'll just conclude firstly by, by thanking you for organising this. I know this issue can be quite complex, and I, I hope those who tuned in with us this evening uh, found it interesting. I hope uh, they found it worthwhile. I want to thank them for giving us their time. I want to thank Andrew and say it's a great pleasure to engage with them, from, even, even though we're both in different countries, is the uh, advantage of Zoom and hopefully... Uh, we engage again on this or other issues. And um, yeah, this is going to go on for quite some time. Unfortunately, it's going to be used uh, to um, denigrate Israel uh, in international forum and the po political uh, arena. Um, I think it's important that uh, from everyone's perspective, uh, there are calm heads. Uh, I think nothing is going to happen with any speed. It may well be this time two years, uh, we may be having another event like this to discuss uh, where it all stands at that point in time. Um, uh, it, it's just simply my, my wish and hope that at some stage uh, uh, we could get beyond uh, the conflict and pouring um, oil on troubled waters or whatever the phrase is um, in this region. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
instead of having these side issues that the Palestinian side seem to want to constantly raise, uh, they may feel this is some sort of victory for them that this uh, investigation is taking place. It isn't. It's a Pyrrhic victory. It puts back the day, because it poisons the atmosphere, it puts back the day uh, of real trust developing again, of real talks taking place. It has everyone um, uh, basically uh, in conflict with each other uh, from the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, and ultimately no good will come of it. So just thank you for arranging this. Um, I hope people found it interesting, and I wish the Alliance well in its work.